Our next topic with dealing with equilibrium is Le Chatelier's principle. Le Chatelier was a French chemist, did his work in the late uh, 1890s, early 1900s. And what he noticed is, okay, you have these equilibrium constants, you have these equilibrium equations. What happens if you mess it up? What happens if you have a system that's at equilibrium and you do something to mess that equilibrium? Le Chatelier said uh, you apply a stress to the equilibrium. Uh, we would say you disturb the equilibrium. So if you have a system that's equilibrium and you disturb it somehow, apply a stress, it turns out the system will shift the reaction. The reaction will shift to the left or the right to minimize the disturbance that you put in there to reestablish the equilibrium. So let's look at some examples of how we can stress out a reaction and see how it responds. Uh, one thing to look at is concentration. Note, if you had a reaction A plus B in equilibrium with C plus D, here's our equilibrium constant, products over reactants. Say this reaction is at equilibrium. What would happen you had this reaction at equilibrium and you add just some more of B to it? Here's a reaction, it's in the flask, it's running fine, it's at equilibrium, everything's fun, and you just throw in some extra B, some extra reactant B. Note, if you did that, you put a stress on the reaction because now the concentration of B has gone up, which means we're no longer at equilibrium, and technically we would be calculating Q instead of K. We're no longer at equilibrium, the denominator is too large which means the reaction looks at this, oh no, I've got too much reactant. Yes, I've got too much of this one, but it's still, when you multiply their concentrations together, I got too much reactant, and my denominator is too large compared to the numerator. So what will the reaction need to do? It needs to restore this equilibrium constant. It needs to make the bottom smaller. It needs to make the denominator smaller. It needs to make the numerator a little bit bigger since you added B and made this denominator too big. And how does a reaction work math? Well, it doesn't. The reaction says, uh-oh, I've got too much B now for equilibrium. I need to shift to the right, make some more C and D in order to compensate for that excess B that got thrown in here. So if you throw in some extra reactant, and note, you don't have to throw in both reactants. You only have to throw in one reactant, and that equilibrium will shift to the right to make more products to try to get rid of that extra reactant that you threw in there. Okay. And this is used all the time in chemistry because say you have a reaction where the equilibrium doesn't lie far to the right, and let's face it, when you run chemical reactions, in general, you don't want to mix A and B to watch them sit there. You want to mix A and B to make C and D is what you want. And so if your equilibrium kind of lies to the left, your equilibrium constant is less than 1, what would happen if you had your two reagents A and B, say reagent A is kind of expensive, but reagent B is really, really cheap, just throw in a whole ton of reagent B. Instead of a 1 to 1 ratio, do a 1 to 5 ratio, maybe a 1 to 10 ratio of A to B. And in doing so, you're going to push the equilibrium to the right because you add so much extra B, 10 times the amount of B that's necessary to react the equilibrium's like, I got to reestablish my equilibrium constant and my B is much too large. So the reaction's got to shift to the right to try to get rid of that B. And in doing so, makes more of your products C and D. Done all the time in chemistry to sh uh, shift a reaction the way you want it. Now, by the other thing, what happens if you're running a reaction? You're running your reaction here. It's at equilibrium, and somehow a bunch of D gets thrown in there accidentally. Or maybe your lab partner doesn't like you anymore because you threw out the reagents that you needed last time. And so your lab partner just dumps a whole bunch of D in there. What, what's going to happen if you add a bunch of product to your reaction that's at equilibrium? That's right, too much D, the equal, there's our stress, the equilibrium will shift to the left, get rid of C and that extra D, and reestablish that equilibrium constant, and your lab partner exacts, exacts their chemical revenge on you. So, moral of the story, don't take off your lab partner. 
Now, the moral story is don't be the type of lab partner that would do that. That's just not nice. Okay, so that's how Le Chatelier's principle relates to concentration. You can also relate it to pressure. You can stress out a reaction by putting it under pressure. I imagine you felt that way before. Uh, but here it only works in chemical reactions when you have gases involved because adding pressure to a solid or a liquid really doesn't change the solid or the liquid too much, doesn't change the density, doesn't, they don't compact very well. But gases, you add pressure, it compacts the gas. And that's a stress. Adding pressure is a stress on a reaction if gases are involved. So let's look at this reaction. N2 gas plus 3 H2 gases are in equilibrium with 2 NH3 gas. Now, question, does nature like high pressure or low pressure? Well, anytime you have a high pressure system, if you have a bottle of soda that's got, you never haven't opened it yet, it's the pressure inside's a little high, what happens when you open up that bottle of soda? Yeah, the pressure releases. Nature always likes to go to lower pressure, high pressure. If your pressure is too high, nature wants to lower the pressure. All right. So assuming you have one container, you have a container, and it's this reaction is going, note that the, if we look at the reactants, we've got one mole of gas plus three moles of gas. That's four moles of gas on the reactant side. On the product side, we only have two moles of gas. So note that by this reaction running, just by this reaction forming products, we go to lower pressure. Because in the same volume container, four moles of gas is going to have twice the pressure that two moles of gas has. Nature likes the lower pressure, so just keeping this in a constant volume container, nature is going to want to get this reaction to go to the right to make less moles of gas, therefore less pressure. So what happens, though, if it's at equilibrium, but there's still a lot of N2 and H2 around, and you want to push it to make more NH3? What can you do? What would Le Chatelier do? to push this equilibrium to the right to make more NH3 dealing with pressure? Well, if Le Chatelier realizes, well, nature wants less pressure, the products have less pressure, Le Chatelier would say, what would happen if I applied more pressure to this situation? If all of a sudden this is at equilibrium, but I applied more pressure, Le Chatelier's principle says, oh no, I stressed out the reaction by applying more pressure, the reaction is going to go to the right to get rid of some of the, to try to get rid of that excess pressure by making fewer moles of gas product compared to reactant. How can you apply pressure? There's two ways. One is if your container uh, has a variable volume. The standard way of doing this is have a container here. Yeah, that's nice. Got your gas moles in there. But the lid is movable. It's a piston that can go up and down here. It won't let gas escape. So if you have your gas molecules sitting in here, it's at a certain pressure being held by this piston. Uh, what happens if you force this piston down? You force this piston down, the volume gets smaller. Now the pressure is higher. This reaction will go towards the right to make more ammonia, more NH3, to try to get rid of that extra pressure. Another way to do it is say you just added some inert gas. You had these two going at equilibrium, this reaction's at equilibrium. What if you just threw in some helium gas? Helium gas doesn't react with anything. Argon gas doesn't react with anything. Those noble gases, that's why they're so noble. They don't react with anything. And you threw in a noble gas in here, like helium or argon, well, adding more moles of gas means the pressure inside this container goes up. If you, the total pressure goes up, if you add more moles of gas, higher pressure, you will push this reaction to the right. By the same token, what happens if this is at high pressure? Like, okay, I've got my ammonia. It's in here. It's at high pressure. The pressure is kind of high because you increase the pressure to try to push it to the right, and that's good. What happens if you let that ammonia out to go to a place of lower pressure? All of a sudden, oh, lower pressure, the reaction is going to go to the left. The ammonia is going to decompose back into N2 and H2 because you, the, with less pressure, it's fine with more moles of gas. 
But those are the two main ways of increasing the pressure on a reaction. Make the volume of the container smaller if you thought in advance and made a variable volume container, or add an inert gas like helium or argon that will increase the pressure. Now, that's fine, but note, if your reaction, if you have the more moles of gas on the reactant side, increasing the pressure is just going to make it go to product side. So you have to look at whatever side has the more moles of gas, the pr adding pressure will get rid, will move the equilibrium away from, push the reaction to make the other side. If our reactants here have more moles of gas, adding pressure get, makes more product. If we have more moles of gas in the product, adding pressure would make more reactants. Okay. So, Le Chatelier's principle, concentration used all time, pressure. Another thing we can do is temperature. And there's really two ways to look at how Le Chatelier's principle deals with temperature. One is the right way, and the other is the wrong way. But the wrong way gives us the right answer all the time. So I prefer the wrong way because it's easier and always gives us the right answer. Let's go through the wrong way. It's not wrong, really. It's just there's more to it. Let's go through an uncomplicated way that isn't exactly right. Let's not call it wrong. All right. Note, if you have an exothermic reaction, say A is in equilibrium with B, if it's exothermic, then heat is given off. Heat can be seen as a product of the reaction. An exothermic reaction, you could write it A is in equilibrium with B plus heat. Heat is a product. For an endothermic reaction, you have to add heat. It sucks in heat. You have to increase the temperature of the reaction to get it to go. So heat is a reactant. It's not going to go unless you add heat to it. Heat plus A is in equilibrium with B. So when you look at it this way and you think about Le Chatelier's principle, if you had an exothermic reaction, and you decided to increase its temperature, add heat, what, how's the equilibrium going to shift? If you had A in equilibrium with B, and you added heat to it, well, if it's at equilibrium and you add heat, heat is a product. The Chatelier's principle says if you add a product, then it's going to go towards the left from that point to make more A because you added some product, you added some heat. If you have an endothermic reaction where heat is a reactant, if you add heat to it, well, heat's a reactant, so heat is going to push it to make more products. So if you have an endothermic reaction, you want to heat it up because that makes more products. If you have an exothermic reaction, you don't want to heat it up. In fact, you want to cool it down. Many an exothermic reaction I've seen run in a flask dipped in ice water. Because if you take away heat, if you put the flask in ice water, that'll take away that heat. And if you take away a product, what's the equilibrium going to do if you take away a product? Well, the reaction has to go to the right to get more of that product. All right. Now, this has an interesting problem because of our, remember our kinetics chapter, that if you want a reaction to go faster, you heat it up. So what if you have an exothermic reaction that is very, very slow? What happens? Oh, it's exothermic, but it's very, very slow. I want it to run faster, so I increase the temperature. But if you do so for an exothermic reaction, increase the temperature, you're going to get less product because adding heat is going to move the shift equilibrium to the left. You're going to get less product if you heat it up. So you want it to run cold. Okay, I want more product. I want it to run cold, so you cool it down. But it's a very, very slow reaction, and cooling it down makes it even more slow. It slows it down even more. So normally, we're going to find out in the next chapter, or, not, or a couple chapters from now, that exothermic reactions you like because the equilibrium tends to lie to the right for exothermic reactions. But if you've got a slow exothermic reaction where you want to make more product, you're in a pickle. Endothermic reactions, we don't like them as much. They tend not to go. However, you heat them up. Not only do you get more product, it reacts faster. That's nice. Okay. Now, what I've said here about heat being the product and heat being the reactant is a nice way to look at the reaction, but it's not really correct. It's, uh, it's, it's more complicated. If we go back a page, recall 
that when we're dealing with concentrations, if you added too much B, then the equilibrium constant is no longer valid, or, but, or not at equilibrium, so your reaction has to get rid of some B, add more C and D, to make K back to its right value. You have to reestablish the equilibrium constant. The concentration in C and D times A and B must again equal K. So when you're changing concentrations, you're literally changing these concentrations, but you're not changing the equilibrium constant. The reaction has to shift so that you reestablish that equilibrium constant. And I don't know if I mentioned it. I, well, I mentioned a little bit. You add B as one way to get a reaction to go to the right. You could take away a product. If you take away a product D here, then the equilibrium would shift to the right to try to make up some of that D that you took because the numerator would be too small. Point is, K is a constant. It reestablishes that same value for K. Temperature is actually different. It affects the equilibrium constant. Actually, when you change the temperature, you are changing the equilibrium constant itself. The constant changes at different temperatures. Something we're about to get into, and we'll just jump to the chase right now, a little uh, uh, spoiler alert. The equilibrium constant equals a forward rate constant divided by the reverse rate constant. So, recall rate constants are governed by the Arrhenius equation, K, the rate constant, equals A times E to the negative EA over RT. So changing the temperature actually changes the value of the rate constant. And if changing the temperature affects the forward rate constant more than it affects the reverse rate constant, then you change K, the equilibrium constant, and that's what happens. And this video is a little bit long, but let's, let's do it because it's the last part of the chapter. All right. Now that we've looked at that, one thing to plug in here. If you add a catalyst to your reaction, catalyst does not affect the equilibrium. A catalyst makes a reaction happen fast, faster, but does not affect the equilibrium. Catalysts do not make equilibrium go more to the right or more to the left. They do not affect equilibrium, only rates. But let's look at our last part, equilibrium and kinetics. Just a real quick derivation. I don't, you don't have to do this derivation. The main point of this is just to show you that the equilibrium constant is the forward rate constant divided by the reverse rate constant. And so if we go back to the previous chapter on kinetics, consider a one-step mechanism. If A plus 2B is in equilibrium with AB2, and this is the only one step in the mechanism, the forward rate law, rate for the forward, equals a rate forward rate constant times concentration of A times B squared. The reverse rate law is K reverse times concentration of AB2. It's a one-step mechanism. This is the one elementary step. Note that if at equilibrium, the forward rate equals the reverse rate. So if the forward rate equals the reverse rate, then follow me here, forward rate equals the reverse rate, then K forward times the concentration of A times the concentration of B squared equals K reverse times the concentration of AB squared. If you solve this for KF over KR, the forward rate constant divided by the reverse rate constant, so divide both sides by this, the reverse rate constant, and then divide both sides by concentration of A over concentration of B, you get this, K forward, divided by K reverse, is concentration of AB2, divided by the concentration of A times concentration of B squared, hey, that's equilibrium constant. Forward rate constant divided by the reverse rate constant equals equilibrium constant. And while we derive this for a one-step mechanism, if you look in your books, you can find that it works for an overall multi-step reaction. If you add up all and everything like that, it works for that too. All right, that is it for the equilibrium chapter. Tune in next video where we're going to start acids and bases. Now, you should be thinking, sweet, we covered acids and bases a bit in Gen Chem 1. You did. I hope you remember it because we're going to take that and then start doing real fun equilibrium ice problems with them.